Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Colin Brown. I'd like to welcome you. And also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, that uh, we're on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, and uh, particularly the uh, uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Tluth nations. And I wanted to say that with, I know we sometimes say that quickly. It, it feels like, oh, that's got to get over and done with in a way, but I just wanted to say that with, with respect and to say that when I, when I am asked to introduce something, I, I think this has to do really with, uh, with, with respect and with justice delayed, which is really all of our concerns. So I wanted to make to say that. Um, I'm going to ask Bill Cranmer, um, who is the uh, hereditary chief of the Namgish First Nations, to come and offer us a greeting this evening, and then I'll introduce you to our guests, who are extraordinary. I I'm, feel so lucky to be in the presence of these uh, people, so you're going to meet them afterwards. But first of all, Bill. Thank you, Colin. So I will say a few words in our language, Kwakwala. Curtis. Also, thank you for being here to to view the film that was made by by Curtis. Also to say thank you on behalf of our old people who were part of the uh, the film, the actors, in those early days. The uh, George Hunt, who was the advisor to uh, Curtis, was my great grandfather. His oldest son, David, was my grandfather, uh, the star of the movie, Stanley Hunt, my great uncle, the, uh, the lady star was my aunt, Maggie, and uh, also my grandmother was in the movie, Abaya, who later became Mrs. Mungo Martin. So we're very, very happy that uh, Curtis made the film. It, uh, of course, uh, uh, brings great feelings to us when we see our old people the way they were uh, in those early days. Um, and uh, if it wasn't for Curtis, that wouldn't have happened. I understand there will be question and ans answers uh, after the, uh, the film is shown, and we'll just be only too happy to, to be here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> so I should just tell you a tiny bit. You've seen, you've met Bill. Um, he is the hereditary chief of Namgis First Nation. Uh, I've had the good fortune to know him for quite a while now, which I'm very pleased about. Um, he uh, was in the Air Force, and he worked in the electronics uh, industry, if you like, when he was younger. He came back to Alert Bay, or Yalis, in 1978, and uh, became involved immediately with the Umista uh, Cultural Center there. And you've been the chair of the board ever since, I think, that moment. And really, I think your vision and your hard work had a great deal to do with building that wonderful cultural center and museum there, which I, if you haven't been, I would, I would really recommend it. And the repatriation of uh, most of the material that was taken from the uh, potlatch in 1921 of your dad. Um, also, Bill is very interested, as is Andy, who I'm going to introduce as well in just a moment, in language. And he's been involved in renewal and preservation of language. He's a Kwakwafu, Kwakwala speaker. And, uh, and that's something that I respect hugely and think is, is really critical, I think. When we lose a language, why would we do that? Why, why, why wouldn't we want the richness of as many languages? As, as we can hear, and, and uh, so I want to honor uh, Bill for that. <clears throat> and he's been a, a part of many foundations and boards and continues to 
work in that territory. Anyway, too much to, uh, too many to mention for now. And he was also uh, quite heavily involved in the process of, and I'll tell you a bit more about this later, of the restoration and reconstruction of this film, which was quite a collaborative effort. So, um, um, thank you for all of that, Bill. And we'll. Everybody will come back and there'll be kind of a panel. We'll talk a bit and there'll be lots of time for questions. Uh, Andy Everson is uh, the second of our third guests. He's uh, from Comox First Nation of Vancouver Island. Um, he is an artist. Uh, he's an activist. He's also uh, a superb, he's very modest, he was very modest at dinner. He's a superb dancer and singer and he sings, he has his own dance group and he's danced in other groups. And I think it would be interesting if you have questions for him to talk about uh, how he sees what you'll see in the, in the film. Uh, and as Bill said, uh, Andy's grandmother is uh, Maggie Frank, and that's the, uh, she's the princess in, in the film. I just think it's amazing. This film, this is the oldest extant feature film in Canada, uh, and we have you here as relatives, which is, to me, really extraordinary. Uh, and he also has a master's degree in anthropology from UBC, uh, where he focused on uh, the expression and ideas uh, of contemporary Comox identity. Um, and he's also interested in language and has worked with uh, restoration and also renewal and preservation of language. And uh, so, Andy, welcome. And uh, Owen Underhill, may maybe many of you will know another extraordinarily distinguished artist in our midst. Sometimes we, I feel we take uh, these people for granted, and we shouldn't. Owen is a composer, a conductor. Uh, he's an artistic director. Uh, he teaches here in the School for the Contemporary Arts, and for many years on and off was director and dean. Um, he's the uh, conductor and music director, I think. Are you the only music director for the Turning Point, Owen? Yeah. And uh, if any of you saw Air India Redacted, Owen was, uh, was both music, conductor, music director and conductor for that uh, show, which just uh, closed this week. Um, Owen has uh, conducted over 150 premieres of music by Canadian composers. He has recordings. Uh, and uh, he is very active with uh, Turning Point Ensemble here in Vancouver, so, and has been really a very strong pillar in the new music community and with his students and for all of us a great, great support and a great interdisciplinary artist as well. So, thank you all. Um, I'm just going to tell you a tiny bit about the movie before we see it. Um, this this was a project of Edward Curtis, who some of you may know mainly as a photographer. In the, at the end of the 19th century, Curtis conceived a grand plan, because at that time the feeling was First Nations people won't be around much longer, so maybe the time is to make photographs of them. And he conceived the idea of 20 huge books uh, called The North American Indian. And he traveled from the very southern part of the United States in fact, northern Mexico, right up to Inupiat, Inuit, Yupik territories up in the, up in the north, making photographs, and also writing uh, what he considered to be uh, ethnographies of the people that he met. Um, and you've probably seen many of these photographs, or at least some of them. They're very pictorial. They're often in silhouette. Um, people are wearing traditional costumes of the kind that they didn't wear any longer. Uh, and um, they, for a while, they were very popular, and then uh, people thought, oh, this is a bit sort of, <clears throat> this is a kind of colonial exploitation of the romantic Indian that doesn't really represent us as 20th century people. And so Curtis went out of favor for quite a while, and then he came back in again later. Um, and uh, if you have, a, if you're interested in him, I recommend that you find a library that has the books, because you know, we see the posters and the photographs. But if you take, if you open those books up, there are, there are large format and photographs, and then there's the text. And the photographs and the text work together. It's pretty interesting. You begin to get a different sense of those photos. They also had folios in the back, big envelopes in the back that had 75 more large, for, large format photographs in. So it was quite, uh, quite a, you know, it basically <laughs> destroyed his family, destroyed everything for him to make this. And um, 
One of the ways he thought of as earning some money was to make a movie. This is about 1912, 1913. He'd been up in Yalis or Alert Bay and Fort Rupert and uh, photographing uh, Kwakwakwa people working with George Hunt. And uh, I think he thought, why don't, I, why don't I enlist these people and we'll make a movie and that way I can earn some money for my project. And they were keen. George Hunt said, well, I'll, I'll help you do it. So he wrote a scenario and the scenario was always about what it was like before contact. In fact, the original title of the script was In the Days of Vancouver. So his idea was to, was to make a film right on the cusp of uh, where contact, you know, when the English and the Spanish first came here. Um, so 1913, he, he brought up a cinematographer. Uh, George Hunt, uh, who Bill mentioned, was really, I think, uh, the more I think about it and the more... I look at the film was really like a co-director. His wife Francine made a lot of the costumes. Uh, people sort of pitched in. Uh, they were paid. Everybody involved in the film was was paid. Um, um, and uh, <laughs> I was going to tell you something, but it's too, it's too long to say. But in any case, what happened is that the film was opened on the seventh of December. Curtis always intended it to be kind of two things. And if you read his book or you read what he's written about it, it can confuse you because on one hand he says, it's a melodrama, it's a fiction film, it's a movie, and I want it to be popular. And on the other hand, he was very determined to where he had uh, sort of ceremonial moments in the film or where he was uh, trying to show traditional methods. He wanted those to also feel somewhat accurate. So he wanted accuracy and he wanted melodrama at the same time. And that's why the film's kind of confusing sometimes. Um, so Curtis, uh, they finished the film in 1914. It was premiered on December the 7th in Seattle, opened in Seattle and New York on the same day. Had a, some fairly good reviews. Uh, there were lots of sort of South Seas movies and, and movies with kind of natives in them at the time, and so it fitted in a bit to that category. And um, then it disappeared. wasn't found again. wasn't seen again until the 40s when someone picked it out of an alleyway in Chicago, the nitrate reels. The uh, the guy kept the guy, he sold it to a collector. The collector had it for a while. He sort of looked at it one day and he thought, gee, there are, looks like there are Indians in here. So he took it to the Field Museum in Chicago and sold it to them. And it sat there for a while until Bill Holm and George Quimby, who were there, found it. And they thought, we should do something with this. And so when they came out to Seattle, or it came out to Seattle to the Burke, they brought, they, what, so here's what they did. It was on nitrate film. It would have looked really great, except for the scratches and breaks. They transferred the nitrate to 16 millimeter, which is really going down in quality. They burned, they destroyed the nitrate, which is what people did in those days, the 35 millimeter. And then that 16 millimeter sat at the Burke and, or other at the Chicago. That went out to Seattle. Bill and George got to work on it and they rewrote all of the intertitles. They took out a couple of shots. You can talk about those later. And then they put together the best idea they had of the movie. And you'll see that it misses, there, there are chunks missing. And the reason that is probably is because in the old days when we, we used film, it was always the head and the tail of the film that tore off first. And so there would be, it was kind of in the transitions that we lose some parts of the story. So uh, Bill Holm then sailed up through the inside passage with this, with a projector in the film and went to the villages and showed the movie in, I guess, Yalis and Lurk Bay and Fort Rupert and maybe Comox or wherever. No one had ever seen it. They'd all heard about it. There were stories in all the communities untold and people were sort of, God, there's my grandfather, there's my uncle, there's my grandmother kind of thing. And so from that information, they, they, he came back and tried to sort of figure out the intertitles. And then he decided to bring, there were some elders who were in Victoria for, uh, for a funeral, and he asked them to come to the Newcomb Auditorium at the museum there, and they recorded a track in Kwakwala for the entire film, and they also foleyed some sound, banging canoes and that kind of thing to add sound effects. And so this film was, the soundtrack was added to the 16 millimeter film, so suddenly it wasn't silent any longer. And uh, it was retitled In the Land of the War Canoes, and it was premiered. And f for many years, it was mostly shown in colleges and universities, and people thought it was a documentary. 
And I think because of the track in Kwakwala, they somehow, but they didn't understand that, of course, and they, they just thought, oh, the, the, <laughs> they thought this was a, a kind of portrait of these people as they live today and, and hear their talking. So it was never, people didn't really understand the context of it. They didn't realize it was a fiction film. Uh, and uh, so it showed in sort of film, some film studies classes and mostly anthropology schools programs and that kind of thing. So a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, Aaron Glass was at the Getty Institute, one of the two people who lead, led the reconstruction, he and Brad Evans. Uh, Aaron was doing some research at the Getty in Los Angeles and he found the score to this film uh, sitting in a portfolio and he thought, oh my God, here's some music to In the Land of the Headhunters. And uh, that he, he's told us that that's when he believed, oh, we can, we can restore this movie. Now we've got the music and we've got the technology. We can digitize it and we can do this. So, so that was the big project. And that took quite a number of years, raising the money, getting the grants, uh, trying to figure out the uh, music, of course, going back, putting the old intertitles back in again. Uh, much you, you'll see that there are still images in the film now that are filling in for the places where there would have been cinema. In 19, 13, 1914, when this was made, the way you copyrighted a film was to m take one frame of every single scene and make a contact print on something like a file card. And you put all those file cards, in this case, in the Library of Congress in Washington. And so on the file cards were sh a single shot of every single scene in the movie. So those are substituted in where there are holes. As I say, they redid the, uh, redid the, the uh, intertitles. Uh, UCLA, which was asked to do the, uh, the sort of technical part of it, was sort of humming and hawing and saying, you know, we don't, we're not sure about this. And, uh, then someone in the lab said, oh, I, I remember, I seem to remember that down in this vault we have something. So we went down and there was real nine of this film sitting there, been there for 60, 70 years, who knows. So with that, we had one 35 millimeter uh, reel of the film. And that's the final reel, that's reel nine. So you'll see that at the end, you'll see suddenly the, the final uh, reel looks quite a bit better and it works. Actually, the story makes sense now. So, um, in any, so there was that, uh, there was uh, Owen and others uh, got together to talk over the music. We, we, I'll ask Owen some leading questions so he can tell you about that process. It's not straightforward. You can imagine uh, that there's a score written for a film in 1914. Uh, the speed of the film as it's being projected is variable constantly. As bits of the film tear off and break off, the film gets shorter. Uh, and so. <laughs> I imagine the conductor is kind of watching and looking at the music and everybody's trying to sort of catch up or do something with the film. So Owen will tell you about that because it's still kind of the case that we have today. So many, many years, lots of consultation. I remember coming up with Aaron up to uh, Umista and we were talking to people about what, you know, <laughs> what you remember and this kind of thing. So almost everybody in the film is now identified, which was never the case. They were always just anonymous in the past. So I think it was... Quite an extraordinary project. There's a book, which I'll show you later and brandish a bit because they're very proud of it, uh, which if you're interested in this, you can find a copy or find it in the library, which everyone involved has written something about this restoration. And <clears throat> that's probably all I should say. We'll talk more about it later. But this is really one of the extraordinary f er, films of early cinema. And it was lost. It was lost for most of its existence. It's coming back now, and I think it really is one of the iconic works. For us here, it's not a Canadian film, but it is a film shot here, the first fe second feature film shot in Canada. And there was so much participation from the, it would have been impossible for Curtis to make this without the huge participation of the community. So really, uh, we can honor them and think about that and realize it in fact was made here. So anyway, I think without further ado, I'll leave it for now, and we'll, the, we'll be back later to talk about it. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Bill Cranmer, Andy Everson, and Owen Underhill. Thank you, Owen. I don't think I was really clear at the beginning that Turning Point did the score, played the music for this DVD. So um, I'd like you to talk about that in just a moment, if I could, please. But Bill, since let's start with you. You've seen this now several times. How does it strike you when you look at this now? 
Well, as we said before, uh, we were really uh, excited to see our old people as they looked in those days. I think it was Andy that said that uh, that uh, he knew his grandmother when she was old and wrinkled, <laughs> and uh, seeing her the way she was when she was young is, is it gives us a very special feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And can you remind us again which of your relatives were in the film, so now that we know the characters? Well, uh, uh, Stanley Hunt was, was the... Uh, Montana. Montana. He's my, my uh, great uncle. He was, uh, I think, the youngest son of George Hunt. And, uh, of course, Maggie Frank was an aunt. And, uh, and uh, I believe... Uh, my grandmother, uh, Abaya, was one of the extras. Helen Knox, another aunt, was an extra. His brother, uh, Bob Olson, was an extra, I believe, mm -hmm. yeah. So there were a lot of, uh, lot of aunts and uncles, and uh, grandmothers, uh, great-grandfather. Of course, George wasn't in the film, but he was an advisor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Andy, for you, of course, Nida, your grandmother, and others? Um, yeah, it'd be the same, same ones, same, same <laughs> relatives, <laughs> just different order. <laughs> and did your grandmother talk about this film when you were growing up at all, or did she have memories about it? Yeah, yeah. When I when I hear about the film, you know, the kind of chronology of it, kind of coming to pass and coming out, um, being lost and all that. Um, for me, I've always known about it in my lifetime um, because. Um, uh, Bill Holm and George Quimby kind of took it on and, and changed it into In the Land of the War Canoes. And my grandmother um, started to get calls from um, Screen Actors Guild and different things. And, and um, so she was kind of uh, feted and celebrated um, in her way. And she, she was featured in a Screen, uh, screen Actors Guild um, um, a magazine article and stuff. So um, I grew up around this. Um, around her telling um, kind of anecdotes and stories um, about the filming process um, throughout my life. Can you remember any of those anecdotes? Yeah, the, um, there's quite a few. Um, one in particular that we, we often will, will say is that um, in one of the canoe scenes when they were going towards shore, um, some of the guys in the canoe, they said, you know, we can't go this fast into shore because we'll, we'll hit the hit the shore <laughs> and um, but um, Edward Curtis said no no you just do it and sure enough they hit the shore and they all fell over and and um, the way of our people of course is is to laugh about these kind of things we <laughs> they all just broke out laughing and stuff and he he actually went to the camera and started pulling out all the film stock um, it would have been like one of the ultimate blooper reels but um, he, he actually threw the, the film into the water because it ruined the, the whole shot <laughs> there's, there's a moment I find kind of touching in there where the canoes do come into the beach uh, and then the, the, the people in the canoes get out but then the guys in the canoe sort of push the boats out push the canoes out so they don't get uh, damaged on the beach it's mm -hmm. kind of an interesting moment there yeah I, I think um, one of the things looking at it from a cultural perspective is, is that um, there's a lot of nuances and little details that um, were included in the film because of the participation of the of the community um, in bringing about um, some of the traditions. So turning around the canoe would be one thing. Um, our people, if they're attacking, would always go in bow first, but there would always be people left in the canoes to turn it around so that they could make a getaway. So it's those kind of little little bits of information that you can kind of glean from from this type of footage. Some of you may have recognized in the, the big canoes, which were in Alert Bay when this uh, film was made, well, most of it was shot at Fort Rupert and mostly on Deer Island off Fort Rupert, but the same two big canoes, which are not Kwakwakawak, I think, um, are in Emily Carr's paintings in Alert Bay from 1912. So if you look at the figures on the front of the canoes in her paintings, they're the same ones. Um, you told me before that... Uh, Edward Curtis stayed at, with your grandparents or with your great-grandparents during the making of the film, is that right? 
Yeah, um, my grandmother always talks about kind of those those personal stories where um, she was left in charge of, of making him tea and stuff at the house because he, he stayed there. And um, and so looking at the film now as, a, as an adult and, and knowing a lot about our family history and lineage, um, there's little little bits that have been added to the story that I think reflect on stories that would have been told um, from our ancestor stories and, and things that are, have been included in, and enrolled into this, into this uh, making of this plot of this film. Interesting. So, Owen. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> what was it like putting this music together and recording it for the, for the film? Well, um, first of all, it was kind of surprising to get the score, although uh, not surprising. I mean, it, it does contain some of the kind of silent movie um, cliches, but it was what was different, I guess, it, is it was a commissioned score by Edward Curtis. So there were about uh, 60 pieces of music that were included. And then uh, uh, David Gilbert at UCLA worked on restoring the score and putting it together because there was uh, some pieces of score had some instruments in and some had other instruments in. And so, although it, it would be fairly clear that certain pieces um, might belong to certain sequences of film, it was mostly unclear. So, so, so therefore, uh, you know, he hypothesized kind of what might go where. And, and, uh, and also, most of the pieces of music um, were not very long, so that required uh, uh, repetition or alteration or changing orchestration or uh, uh, trying it different ways and, and what was really great is when we did it in 2009 is that we had uh, 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 the Guawina dancers and William Waston and uh, and uh, you were part of it there as well and, and there were performances in Los Angeles and Seattle and Vancouver and uh, so I was involved in the Seattle Vancouver one, so also we did a live performance, which you know is how silent movies were done and it makes it more difficult because you have to shift around pieces of music and and always timing it uh, and so I had to develop certain hand signals uh, for that. but what was really wonderful about that show was that the second half of the show was Guawina dancers uh, performing there and showing their own uh, culture. So that made a, a more complete uh, picture because it, in some ways it's kind of a strange role to bring this, but, but that's what it is. It's, it's a reenactment and that's really what um, Aaron and Brad wanted to do was to restore the score. Yeah, they wanted to make this uh, as close to the original as they, as they possibly could so that we could see what Curtis's intention was. I should mention that uh, you probably noticed how there were different colors throughout the film. When it was first made, it was both tinted and toned. And tints were what you saw, pink, blue, green, that kind of thing. That was done in a special tinting vat in uh, California. It's probably the last one, who knows, but probably the, one of the last ones in the world. And toning, uh, back when I guess labor was really cheap, uh, toning is actually where people would paint on every single frame of the film. And so you can imagine those fire scenes would have all had little bits of embers and fires and flames coming out of them. So it would have all, but when, uh, when the rest reconstruction was made, it was, uh, it just, there just wasn't enough money to do, to, the, to do the toning. So that's where the tinting comes in. And uh, they, they kind of, uh, with the final reel that you saw, I mean, it's quite damaged, but every so often it suddenly becomes really clear, doesn't it? And you can say, oh, that's what it would have looked like. They were able to get some idea of what the, to what the tinting was like from that reel, and then they went back, back through the whole thing. Um, and, and I should also say, and then maybe we'll uh, open the house to questions, and there are microphones, aren't there, I think, that will go around? Yeah. Um, that this film was... Uh, was actually pretty influential. While we might think, oh, we wish people knew it better, in fact, it had quite a strong influence on uh, Sergei Eisenstein, who saw it in New York, and uh, uh, and uh, and on I'm sorry, on Robert Flaherty, who who saw it in New York, and it was several years. It was what almost what 1922. So it's eight years later that Flaherty 
came out with uh, Nanook of the North. But he probably wouldn't have made such a good film if he hadn't seen this and hadn't had, it, hadn't had a chance to talk with Curtis about filmmaking continuity and that kind of thing. But um, are there any questions? Yes, please. So uh, someone will bring you a mic and then... Uh, we want to record this if it's okay and then if you don't mind. Thanks. Hello. Is it on? Okay. <laughs> I'd just like to say, Gaila Kessler. Um, I've waited a long time to see you again. I know the last time I saw you was uh, a long time ago on the reserve before we left. Um, I've heard about this movie over the past few years and I never, I never knew it was about our culture. You know, um, I grew up knowing that uh, we we weren't headhunters and we didn't do all that kind of stuff. So when 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 um, I heard, I forget who they were, but they're, they're quack quack you are. And uh, when I heard them talking about it, I I, I thought they were, they were talking about an African show. <laughs> yeah, because you hear a lot of stories about headhunters in Africa. Um, and just to reintroduce myself, uh, my Indian name is Husukamet. Uh, my given name is Alan Williams. I'm Ladio's younger son. Um, I brought my family here because when I found out it was about the Kwakwakwakwa Nation, I wanted them to see what what it was like back in the old days. I was telling my youngest daughter, this uh, is autumn rain, and then the one in front of me is summer breeze. And um, I wanted them to learn, I, you know, as young as they are, I would, would like them to learn more about our culture. Um, it excites me because uh, I've been Lachwales for the past 30 years. I've tried to reach out, but I was told no. So to find out about this this movie and and it's find out that it's not about the African people and it's about our people, I was like my jaw drop. I was like, no way, you know. Um, my question is is back in the day, is that exactly how we were, or how were we back in those days? basically uh, how we were in those days. People, uh, people made war amongst each other. They didn't actually go to, for the purpose of getting heads. The, uh, what they did was when they, when they killed their enemy, they cut their head off. And a lot of times they put the heads on top of sticks on the ground. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, uh, the sorcerer uh, uh, that happened. Uh, I think even in the latest uh, 60s, there were there were uh, stories about some people still being able to do that. Uh, people called them witch doctors, amongst other things. And uh, the of course the dances uh, <coughs> are basically uh, the same uh, as they were shown, not as they were shown. But uh, those are the type of masks and dances that we show in our potlatches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I was telling my oldest daughter. She was uh, watching and got kind of curious. And I was trying to, I tried to remember as much as I could about the names. Uh, one of the names I remember from back in the 70s is the, the humsum, mm -hmm. the, the long beak birds. You know, I looked at her and I was, I, I know a little bit of words like the kula, the ilugan, and I just wanted to say thank you and ask that. So I, I would really like to learn more about about our ways. You know, something I can hand down to the children instead of the Lachwiles. You know. I love the Lachwiles ways, but I want to learn more about our culture, the Kwa Kwa you know. Thank you. Gaila Kessler. Gaila Kessler. Well, I, I had a question. 
uh, that's along those lines as well. When I was watching the wedding scene, I was thinking of the potlatch because it, you, it, we were watching these beautiful cedar boxes being loaded into the canoes and all these wonderful gifts. And I got to thinking about the, the what must have been quite tense relations um, because the repressive era of, of the anti-potlatch laws were just coming into being, I would imagine, in the 1920s or so. And I was wondering if, if you knew anything um, about those relations at all, if, if there were any stories that you had, either of you had heard um, a, a, about that tension, or maybe there was none. Hello, Councillor. Uh, your question was uh, about weddings. Are they still... No, um, so, I'm sorry. My question was about whether or not, um, under Curtis's direction uh, to celebrate, you know, the wedding scene and so on and so forth, um, if there was any tension between um, or, or being felt, I guess, at that time um, already of the sort of the looming repressions of the potlatch laws that were to, to come eight years down the road or so. Uh, if that was felt at that time, or if it was still, potlatch was still allowed and it was still enabled. The potlatches were were illegal right from around when the Indian Act was first first uh, put in place, and people were still potlatching even though it was illegal, and uh, uh, it was illegal when they were making this film. People were people were being arrested uh, and sent to trial, but most of the judges of the day uh, felt that the potlatch law was was not a very just law, so they would uh, wouldn't uh, really sentence them to anything other than maybe a suspended sentence. It wasn't until uh, the Indian agent Alert Bay uh, changed the act so that he could be the judge, and of course. Uh, as one of our old people said, we, we didn't have a chance once that happened. So he not only arrested our people, but he sat as a judge. And in 1921, uh, uh, when my father had a potlatch in Village Island, a bunch of our people were arrested. The Indian agent sat as a judge, and 26 of our old people, chiefs and other older ladies, were sent to prison for anywhere from two to six months. And Alert Bay really suffered because that's where the Indian agent lived and that's where the RCMP lived. So it, it did have a, a very serious effect. But uh, during the film, I would imagine that uh, Curtis had permission to do these uh, kind of dances because it was illegal to even to even dance, uh, even to wear, wear regalia. It was illegal. So I, I suspect that he had permission. There's a bit of hypocrisy there, then. <laughs> Another question, perhaps, or so, yeah. Thank you for showing that film. My question is about the role of women. There was a woman who had, was involved in the war, in the fighting. She was throwing some spears. So I was wondering. Uh, were there many women warriors? Uh, because there were not many women in the canoes. Uh, can you comment on that? I don't believe there were there were any women warriors because that was uh, mostly uh, the men were the warriors. Yeah. Oh. I, I also really appreciated the film and your participation here. Um, I just had a question, for example, it was with like some of the other questions, the, the degree of accuracy and so on, because I gather this was Curtis's story that he had created. So I'm wondering, there was um, an indication that some of the people who participated were able to change it in, in certain ways. But is this mostly his story, really, but he was quite accurate? And one of the things that struck me was um, when Motana went to the, I um, can't remember what it was called, but essentially the place of the dead, 
and it was referenced as being a gruesome spot. And I just thought that wasn't my understanding of the way places where dead people were. And I was wondering if you had any comments on that. Um, the, the Island of the Dead scene that was actually using a New Chalmuth Whaler Shrine, which is a very sacred um, shrine that they, they used. And um, so it wasn't actually from our, from our culture. So that was one thing that it was totally changed. Um, but there were, I, th I think overall it was, it was Curtis's vision that was created through discussions with, with Kwakwakiok people. Um, sitting around, like I said, you know, having tea and stuff with, with my great-grandparents and, and different ones and George Hunt, um, talking about some of these, these things. And I think some of the, some of the details, again, um, one of the points that I wanted to bring up was um, when they were returning after burning the village of Wadzulis, uh, they returned um, with heads um, in their canoe. But um, if you look very closely at that scene, they're also wearing... Um, neck rings and they're wearing they're carrying masks in their hands and part of our traditions is that when you when you go out warring with another tribe if you kill people that own a certain dance uh, it's your right to take that dance from them and so um, you can see the 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 main bad guy um, when he goes on this warring expedition he doesn't have a neck ring on but when he returns he has a neck ring and um, for us, when if you were to kill somebody with a with a hamatsa dance, for instance, um, you could take that dance from them. And when you return to your village, you enter into that ceremonial realm. And so you see, when they're getting off the canoes, they turn to the left, like they're entering into our winter ceremonial winter ceremonial dances. Um, we always turn to the left as we're entering our dance floor, and it's exactly the same in in those. So there's those little subtleties that. Um, Curtis would never know about unless our people um, told him about all of those little things. Uh, yes, thank you. I certainly enjoyed the, uh, the film. The first time I've seen it and completely like that. Um, a couple of questions. There, there was nose decorations uh, shown and what have you. But there was no labret, and, and the labret was the extension of the lower lip. Was that uh, par, uh, part of your culture or not? I don't know. There were uh, some, some of our different uh, members of the Kwakwakwak that did things like that, the, shaped, the, shaped the heads so that the head, head was... Uh, shaped differently uh, and uh, I don't think there was too much of the uh, uh, the lip uh, uh, changing uh, but uh, I know one thing uh, that was very noticeable was the I think it was the Quetzino people of the west coast that shaped the heads of their people uh, very good thank you uh, one more question if I may um, I noticed that the men had a certain Kilt sort of arrangement was that just for uh, uh, for Curtis and wanting to make it more genteel, or was it in fact uh, a part of the normal dress of people? Yeah. Of the men? Um, traditionally, our, our people wear, wear blankets in any of a number of different ways. So the men would often go bare-chested, and, and from what I understand, in uh, some certain circumstances, women would too in in the summertime. But uh, most often, they would wear like a cape on the top part but um, there, we we still tie our blankets in different ways um, sometimes we'll wear it just um, in a ceremonial fashion like this um, other times we'll wrap it around our bodies and and tie them in different ways and for men you would often do it kind of like a like you said like a sarong or a kilt or something uh, thank you very much I believe they didn't wear wigs however no. uh, as the <laughs> actors in the films did you can see when uh, when uh, Knight is being set free, the uh, slave's about to lose his hair. <laughs> the poor guy's kind of trying to keep his head up. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I've actually visited Alor Bay. 
uh, I believe, two years ago. Um, I attended a potlatch with uh, Sir Robert Joseph, and it was conducted by um, Bowdick. He's a resident artist at um, UBC. Um, it, was, um, it took place, actually, at the Big House, which is really magical, and I had two exotic days uh, with the Kwaka Waka Waku uh, uh, band. Uh, further west of, of the building, there's um, a very gruesome building. It's called San Michael's. I think it's a residential school. Uh, back in, in, in your day, how um, affected your community you know, was by the nature and the culture of residential schools. Um, was there any sort of like penetration? You know, you experienced it, I think. So, what do you think? What's your take on that? Thank you. What was the effect of residen residential school? Yeah. Back then, how you, you experienced it, right? So, like, um, if you can just share it with. Not all of uh, the young people were sent to the residential school. Uh, we attended in Alert Bay uh, uh, Indian Day Schools, where you went to school and then you went home. Uh, a lot of the people that went to the residential school were from the north. Uh, the Nishka, the Haida, the uh, Bella Kulas, uh, Bella Bella. Uh, and uh, that's where most of the students came from. And uh, yes, the residential school had a very serious effect on, uh, on our people. Uh, it, it followed the potlatch prohibition. The potlatch prohibition uh, after, the, uh, after the 1921 uh, potlatch, uh, people were arrested uh, sent to prison in 1922. And that pretty well stopped the uh, potlatches in Alert Bay. Some of the outlying villages still potlatched because the police weren't there. Uh, but it was followed very shortly by the construction of the, the residential school in Alert Bay, which opened in 1929. And, uh, of course, it had a very serious effect on the, on the children that attended. They were allowed to speak their language. Uh, uh, but uh, getting back to the, the potlatch prohibition uh, in 1922, uh, it had a very serious effect on the whole community as a whole. Uh, because we couldn't do any of our ceremonies. One of the most important ceremonies that we do is uh, remembering the loved ones that have passed on. We, we uh, are able to uh, do the ceremony, sing songs, uh, remembering our loved ones, um, and then let go of that sorrow uh, after the ceremony has been completed. But our people couldn't do that for three decades. They had no way of letting go of the, the sorrow that they had for their loved ones. So it had a very serious effect on the community as a whole. And, of course, the chiefs that uh, weren't allowed to potlatch anymore lost any of their, their uh, credit they might have in the potlatch ceremony system. Uh, so they lost uh, a lot of their wealth, and, uh, and they couldn't get it back. Mm -hmm. Andy, can you tell me about the dancing in the film for, from a person who cares very much about this? What did you see and learn and what? Yeah, um, I guess for us as, as um, dancers, being able to watch the old people dance, I think it's um, there are movements that the old people do that we're, some of our dancers don't do the exact same movements anymore and, and we're able to learn from those those dance movements. Um, much of the same dances that are shown in the film we do, um, we still do today. Uh, we still do those dances in our potlatch ceremonies. Um, there were kind of special considerations I think for the film in the ways that it was presented um, that you know that altered the dance a little bit from our, our traditional way um, in order to make it look good on film and, and, and for it to actually be shot 
um, from a stationary camera. Um, but um, for us as, uh, as dancers that still do the same dances, we're able to, to learn from those today. Yeah, you can see that Curtis, the frame is really locked down all the time and he fills it up with action. People have to go around in circles <laughs> to kind of stay. Or, or you, in, in the one, uh, in the scene with Night again, the, you, you can tell, you can figure out the frame from where the poles are. You can get, keep saying all the time, maybe, maybe that's a bit technical, but it's interesting to see the kinds of restrictions that, that they had in those days. Other thoughts or questions or queries or... Anybody? Yeah. Is there one up there? Okay, and then there's another one at the very back too, please. Um, a couple of questions. One is... I was curious about how the shots where there were, um, where you saw the side of the canoe um, as if you were sitting on the back of the canoe. I was wondering if that, w if the camera was actually on the back of the canoe. So a technical question. And then the other one was, um, I'm curious about what the consultation process was like, like why um, why the community agreed to be in this film and um, whether they got anything out of it. Like, what was the exchange for starring in this film and um, so what were some of the kind of politics around that while it was being made and then after it was released? Um, the technical question, I'm, I'm assuming, yeah, I agree, I think, it was probably in the back of the... Yeah, the camera's just the, sitting in, in the canoe. Sitting in the stern. Yeah. yeah. Um, nice shot. In terms of what was given back, I think it can't be um, understated the, the role that George Hunt played in, in kind of brokering um, just about everything, every kind of arrangement with the community to create um, regalia for the, for the movie, to create um, the, the house post. He even carved... I believe at least one one of the house posts himself, um, and his his role in getting everybody on board was was absolutely crucial. Um, in terms of perspective in 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 the larger scheme, um, George Hunt had been working with uh, Franz Boas, uh, famous ethnographers ethnographer, um, for many years prior to that. So um, he was very familiar with the way that anthropologists worked and kind of what they they were looking for in terms of creating an ethnographic present. Um, in terms of return for the people, they, they got paid for, for doing this. Um, I, I was actually going to bring my, my grandmother's bracelet. Um, she was paid a, a gold, a piece of gold, a gold coin basically for, for um, being in the film, and she had it made into a, a carved bracelet that I, I own now. But um, so I was going to wear it, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, I was just wondering, could you tell us a bit about the masks and the and the animals that were being represented? Um, there, there's there's a number of different masks, and um, in our in our winter ceremonials, we have a whole range of different masks that are used, um, and those the different masks vary according to different families and different lineages. Um, certain masks um, that the gentleman here was talking about, the humpsump is a is a cannibal bird mask that's one of the attendants of of uh, the Hamatsa dancer, or cannibal dancers, but um, so they appear in the film, but there are other masks that um, likely um, kind of represent different ancestral figures. Um, a lot of times um, when we're opening a potlatch, we'll ask our, 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 one of our ancestors will make an appearance at the, at the beginning of a potlatch, um, and different families have different different masks according to their, um, their ancestral privileges and those vary according to families and certain songs and dances um, get exchanged through marriage and um, one of the interesting anecdotes that I was 
thinking about as, as again as I as I get older and watch this and knowing my own family history, I was listening to a, an audio tape of my grandmother talking about um, when her parents got married. Um, when when they got married, part of the dowry from um, from George Hunt's family that side um, for his eldest daughter Emily Hunt, um, my grandmother's mother, was this mask called Wigget and one of the main characters in here is called Wigget. And, um, and apparently it, in my grandmother's story, um, they were dancing it on the, on the bow of the canoe. And I, it kind of made me think about the possibility that um, Edward Curtis kind of heard this same story from, from Emily Hunt and Charlie Wilson and George Hunt um, talking about, about our own family history and and about their own dowry and how that that dowry piece was presented um, on the on the wedding day for it to be appearing on the on the bow of a canoe. Um, so I, I kind of saw that as as a way to um, that may have influenced um, the famous scenes where the where the mass dancers are on the on the prow of the canoes. And all of our ceremonies are connected uh, to the, the uh, creatures that live in the forest, creatures that live in the ocean. And uh, a lot of our creation stories are about those creatures having the ability to turn into a human being. That's how some of our creation stories uh, start. Uh, the Numbris, for instance, uh, one of their creation stories is a giant uh, sea monster with a halibut type body came out of the ocean and became the first one of the first numbies. And uh, so there's the ceremony for that. So as I say, all of our ceremonies are connected to the, to the animals of this world, either walking or flying or swimming. Um, I have a I was just wondering if any of the people that were in the film ever had a chance to see the film. Um, I don't think any of them saw it when it was originally um, released. I think the only ones that saw it were the ones that were um, still with us in the 70s and into the 80s and 90s. Um, so people like my grandmother and, um, and her sister and her brother, I know the three of them, they, they all appeared in the film and they were able to see it. And I'm, uh, from what I understand, that was their first time uh, viewing the film. Yeah, they, I, I think that they got a kick out of it. <laughs> they, they, they like seeing themselves as, as young people and, and remembering all the stories and fun times that they had. The sequence with the war canoes I can remember in the 70s uh, was shown all the time in Victoria at the museum because uh, I saw it there many times. Yeah. Um, what, some tiny bit, tiny more film tidbits. Um, the whale, <laughs> there's no whaling uh, uh, in between Alert Bay and the mainland of Vancouver Island. Uh, and so Curtis rented that whale in Haida Gwaii and took Stanley Hunt up there. And those are, those are Haida pullers, uh, apparently pulling the whale. Uh, so that was another kind of embellishment. I mean, that's what I mentioned in the beginning. It was this sort of fictional structure for the, uh, for the story. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is, you remember the scene where, where Stanley Hunt looks out of the mouth of the whale and kind of looks around and then grins. Um, <laughs> Breaking the fourth wall, really, which is pretty amazing. Uh, that was taken out of in the land of the war canoes, uh, and uh, it, would put, it was put back in by Aaron and uh, Brad. So that was—I uh, never quite found out why they did. Oh, I know why. Yes, do you know why? Did, did Bill Holm ever tell you why they? I remember now why they cut it out. Because because in 1968, when he came up and showed it in, in up through the villages people would laugh and they say, oh, there's Jonah in the whale. <laughs> and he said, we can't have them thinking about the Bible <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Out. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, our people uh, didn't uh, hunt whales. 
matter of fact, my uncle, uh, who was uh, George Hunt's uh, grandson, married a lady from the West Coast, Antiema, and she used to tell him when he uh, got a little out of hand, he said, you guys are just clam diggers, we're whalers. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thoughts? Anybody would say yes, please. What? Where's our mic? Here it comes. Hi. Um, going back to the um, pot band pot latches. I was in Alert Alert Bay. Who is it? Um, last summer, and I visited the museum there, and it was really fascinating. And everybody must go and look at all of them all the masks that have been returned from, is it the Museum of Man? In All over. <laughs> no, but uh, most of them were um, apparently from, the, uh, from Ottawa. And um, they told us that even though the potlatches were banned in the middle of winter when it was really, really cold, the RCMP never, never stepped out of their houses. So they were able to have their potlatches then. Yeah, I remember when I was uh, uh, not very old, my mother used to take us to Turner Island where they still potlatched, uh, uh, took us to Guilford Island where they used to potlatch. Uh, but my father never attended potlatches after the 1922 potlatch uh, trials because he felt so bad about the people being put in jail. Uh, the first public potlatch he attended was when Mungo Martin opened the big house in Thunderbird Park in Victoria. It was in 1953, and that's the first public potlatch that my father attended. And uh, we all went, uh, some of us young guys went, and were part of the animal kingdom that he showed at the, uh, at the potlatch. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we should probably wrap it up. Any last thoughts that you'd like to, anything you'd like to say? <laughs> no, I'd just like to say Gila Kessler, thank you to SFU uh, for, for doing this. Thank you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, Owen, very, very much. And thanks all for coming. Okay. Yeah.